Good afternoon, everyone. Great, great. I'm glad. Uh, thank you all so much for participating in this session. It is our last session of the day before our networking reception. So we're going to try to keep the presentation energetic and upbeat so that you all don't fall asleep on me. All right. <laughs> okay, so I am Tracy Ford and I work at the University of North Carolina system. And the UNC system is a public institution, um, 16 universities. We have two high schools and we have five public HBCUs within our system. Um, as part of what I do at UNC, I'm responsible for working with our campuses on student success initiatives, on um, retention, graduation, persistence from a sort of more of a system perspective, although we do work with individual campuses. Um, prior to working at UNC, I worked at North Carolina a and for five and a half years, and I was the student success person for our campus. So this particular topic is very near and dear to me, it's very personal um, because a lot of what I discuss and a lot of what I do comes out of my personal experience. And so um, I think at some point in this conversation, I hope that um, much of what is said today will resonate with you and for you to begin to think and reflect upon those things that help you get through college and how we can use that to help our current students matriculate and be successful. So with that, I'll state up front a few things to give context for my presentation. Number one, this presentation is part biographical, part lecture, and part sermon, which means <laughs> in the call and response tradition of the Baptist church, I do expect to hear back from you. If it's something that makes you feel good, just say amen. All right. Okay. Um, so I, I, may, I know the title of the presentation was on uh, the development of retention plan, but I think that's just the first step. So I always want to talk in terms ho of holistically about developing a student success plan. And retention and graduation are outcomes of a well-crafted campus-wide plan that is communicated widely, implemented effectively, and assessed continually. So these are outcomes of what we do. It's not over-retained students. The retention number, the retention yield that we get is a result of an outcome of how we do business every day. And so I, I really think in terms of context, you have to think about that. It's not that students retain themselves. Institutional retention is an institutional outcome based on a plan that you have in place that's implemented effectively, that's assessed continually, and you use data to continue to improve your retention. So, Another piece of context before we get into the presentation. So I have this theory of the three H's when it comes to working with retention, and this is something I would talk to my staff about widely. And that is the first H in, our, in my three H theory is the head. Our head is where the knowledge, we need that. We need to know what we're doing, we need to have strategies, we need to have information. It's the center of what we know about retention, what we know about students, what we know about our institution. Then there's the heart. That's where, that's our center of caring, of nurturing, of how we feel about our students, how we show them um, our appreciation for them, their love for them, our love for our institution. And the third one is our hands, and that's what we do. That's how we actually get up every day and go about our work based on our strategy, based on our plan. So to do this work well, you have to have your head in the game, You've got to have your heart in the game, and you've got to have your hands ready to work. Because this is hard work, but it's heart work as well when it comes to retention. So you cannot do this work without good, knowledgeable, caring people who are willing to lay it all on the line. Okay? And so we'll talk about sometimes the hard decisions we have to make as it relates to personnel when it comes to this work. So here's my myth for retention before we, get, again, get into the presentation. How many of you all have heard retention or student success is everyone's job? Okay. I used to hear that too on my campus. So I finally would go around to the offices that were sort of kind of doing retention work or my, my president would say that, my chancellor would say, well, Tracy, retention is everybody's job. And I said, well, why is it that when the retention numbers aren't right, I'm the only one sitting here? <laughs> I said, so what I need to know is, come with me to see the chancellor. You say it's your job, 
you gave them resources to do all these little side projects, then I need them to be on this hot seat. Move over. Come on with me. So I believe that retention, really, it is everyone's job, but you have to give people specific responsibilities with accountability attached. And you monitor that accountability. Okay, so we stand up, it's everybody's job, but then you've got to say, what is your job? What is your job? And what is your job? And what are those accountability metrics? So the myth of is everybody's job, just make sure when people say that, that there's accountability attached to everybody who we deem responsible for this, including leadership. So, all right, who can tell me of some great philosophers? Just name one or two, the people we, Said it, Nietzsche, all right. Anybody else? Aristotle. All right. Has anybody ever heard of the great philosopher Johnny Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> it's cheaper to keep them. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is that in the retention world, and I'm sure my brothers and sisters in enrollment management would agree, that we have to do a much better job with that because it's cheaper to keep that student that you already have than to go out and recruit a new one. All right, so you add Johnny Taylor to those lists of philosophers. <laughs> All right, so the other thing is that we must make hard decisions when it comes to our retention initiatives in three specific areas, in personnel, in policy, and in our resources. Those are just tough decisions you have to make. And we all make them every day. I know resources are scarce. But sometimes the toughest one we have to make deals with personnel. So my assistant director at my last position, awesome lady, we had a great relationship. And But the work we do when it comes to retaining students is very serious. You know, it's, I look around, and we had about 2,000 students that we were working with when I worked at A&T in our undecided area. So often, I would just see 2,000 2, blue folders of students. And I remember it when I was doing genetics research at National Institutes of Health. And we had samples up there of women who had breast cancer. And we were doing research. And as kids, we're in the lab laughing, joking around. Samples fall on the floor. and my uh, director at the time, NMD, who did research as well, he said, um, he called us in and he said, you take this seriously. Because while that looks like a test tube, that represents a lady who's over in the hospital going through chemo. It represents people. So you can't be frivolous about what you do. So when I see those folders, they represent people. They represent somebody's child who's out here trying to make it. So we have to take this work very, very seriously. And so, again, this is just context um, as we build for the presentation. So I'm serious about who I hire to work with young people and what roles we put them in. Some people have great organizational strengths and zero people skills. Don't put those people on your front line. All right, right. Those people on your front line who do not have zero tolerance for treating anybody with disrespect. Zero. So. I don't mind being the bad guy when it comes to things like that and have had to make those tough personnel decisions. We'll continue to make those and those are things you have to really think about. So I told my assistant director, called in, and I said, you know, you know, we have a friendship and I promoted you into this role to be assistant director, but I just want to set the record straight. If at any time I feel like you are not performing at the level I need you to perform, I will terminate you and I'll come to dinner at your house that night because it's not personal. I love you as a friend, but as an employee, if it comes to that. So we gotta make really tough decisions. And I focus on the people piece a lot because much of what we're gonna talk about is relational. Why students come back, why they wanna be on the campus, a lot of it has to do with the person who's poured into their life, the person who connects with them. So it's important to have right people. So now what I want you to do is, first I was gonna have you get up and move around, but you all look too comfortable. But what I want you to do is take about a minute and tell somebody next to you or a couple minutes a retention story, either your story about something that happened to you in college, something you had to overcome, or a student that you're very proud of who had to overcome something. But I want you to think about this in the context of what was in place at the institution, people, programs, resources to help you or that person persist through college 
and graduate. So take the time to talk to your neighbor because we kind of know each other, but sometimes we don't know our stories about why it is that we sit here today, how it is that we were able to sit here today. And so I'll kick it off a little bit. Here in the audience for probably the first time ever seeing me in this professional capacity is my Auntie Nancy. Wave your hand, Auntie Nancy. <laughs> I, I grew up in Atlanta, I graduated high school here and went on to college, but um, my auntie raised me because my mom died when I was young, didn't know my father, um, moved around a lot, and finally at 13, my aunt and my uncle, who's my mother's brother, um, she's married to him. <clears throat> so they came and picked us up, my sister, my brother, and myself, at a motel in St. Petersburg, Florida, and a kind of motel that people rent by the hour, if you know what I mean. So it's a lot of cleaning rooms just so we could stay there, had a hot plate, we had a room, sometimes we went to school, sometimes we didn't. And they came and they moved us to Atlanta and it opened up a whole new world. So my retention person and my rock is my Auntie Nancy. So for you all, just take a moment to talk about with somebody your story. Because I tell my students, they come and they oh, Dr. Ford, you don't get it. I say, oh, you don't know where I've been. Shut the door. Because we're about to have that conversation. Don't make assumptions about what you think you know about me and this journey. Okay? So just take a minute and share that, and then we'll move into the presentation. I know I did over here with the group that I talked with. So again, one, and so just the, the last thought before I go into the presentation is this, that I'm sure some of the conversations as I requested centered around either you or one person that you knew. And those one successes at a time are absolutely wonderful. But we have the ability to scale this up to touch all students and that's what's the great thing about having a plan is that we can have things in place that will help even more students be able to experience some of that one-on-one -on -one mentoring and relationship that we all had to get us through college okay so we're going to highlight the need and importance of achieving high levels of student success give a general definition of student success how we develop a student success plan some components of a plan and provide an overview of best practices. We're also going to talk about some things that you can do for low or no cost. Because I know finances are important, but I also know, I also know, uh, just as my, my mentor, Mary McLeod Bethune, who I claim as a mentor, um, <laughs> um, you know, there's a story that people were amazed at the results she was achieving at her school. They were just amazed. Came from far and near, wanted to go and find this school that was producing all these wonderful results. And when they would get there, they would think they were in the wrong place because it was just this place that was so unassuming and there was really nothing there. And they asked her, where's the school? How do you get these results? And she said, my school is in my heart. My school is in me. My school is in what I do every day. So you take the embers from the wood and you write with those. You, you recite things. You may not have something to write with. You do those things. We always are saying we have to do more with less. That's just how it is, unfortunately. But that's what it is. And we can do more with less and we just will be strategic about them. Okay. So student success is important. We know that economic viability is important to everybody. So many current and future jobs will require a college education, college skills. 
We also know student debt is over a trillion dollars. Here's what we can't do, because all these new studies are coming out, especially from conservative think tanks, that many of our institutions are contributing to poverty levels because students come and do not finish and have high debt, okay? Very high debt. So they spend much of their time uh, in poverty for, uh, for a whole lot of reasons. They didn't finish school. They have this debt hanging over their head, sometimes thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in debt and no degree. So the other thing is that we found a very small amount of debt can also create a cycle of poverty. We looked at our data within the UNC system and we found that 30% of our students who default, default with less than $5,000 of loan. So it's not always 50000 Sometimes it's just 5,000 and you feel overwhelmed, especially as a young person at 19 and 20 with that kind of debt, okay? So we have to be focused on student success partly because of those reasons. Um, we know that only a little over half of students who begin college actually complete a degree in four years. We look at our own six-year graduation rates and some of them are in the teens and 20s and 30%. And I often say to people that it's wonderful. We all like things. I don't know if you all saw it in the video. These cars belong to you all. But I walked down the street today and it was a Bentley out there, uh, a <laughs> Lamborghini, and some other car that I knew was expensive, but I didn't know what it was. <laughs> if it was in the Toyota family, I could tell you what it was. <laughs> but this was in something else. I didn't quite know what that was. But I am so thankful that we're in a profession. We don't build widgets, we build people. I love the fact that we build the people that build the things. Okay, that's the base of it, you know? So that's so important because none of what we have around us right now with just came out of the blue. We build the people that build the things. So we also know that federal accountability and other accountability measures and accreditation drive much of what, some of the focus of student success. So, Barriers to success, and I just only wanted to put this up here because I know they exist, but I also know through the test of time and by the fact that all of us are sitting here that barriers can be overcome. Can't ignore them, but you don't focus too much on them unless they really have been identified as something that's causing a significant barrier for your student success. But these are things that you're gonna always have. Funding issues, people who are scared, you know, leadership issues, and so, you know what they are. Think about them on your campus, but also think about the fact that all of this can be overcome. So, step one. You can't do any of this without leadership. And I believe leaders lead from the front. Don't tell me, Tracy, you're responsible for retention. And so we kind of had this conversation, and again, as I told you, part of this is bi biographical in this presentation, but it was, we hire you to be over a student success center. Sounds great. But no one told the deans, the department chairs, <laughs> and the other units they had to participate. So leadership has to step in and create the culture and the structure that's necessary in order for your student success plan to work. Because remember we stated earlier, it is everybody's job, but if you cannot assign accountability to the chairpersons, to the deans, to the student affairs folks, then you really don't have a viable plan. Right? So we need our leaders, and that's not just the president, the provost, that's your board, maybe your alumni, whatever your leadership structure is on your campus. So leaders have to align resources with the goals. Right. So it's important that you have a leader that understands this. Now, you may have to do some education to your leaders about retention, student success, what some of the issues are. This may not be their expertise. Right? And for many of them, it's not their expertise, and that's fine. But that's why we have you. As my colleague said earlier in his presentation, you know, you're the expert on your campus uh, in certain areas of student success, or you may be the student success person on your campus. So you may have to educate your leadership on why this is important and what has to happen. So we had an issue on our campus where students were struggling in math. Pulled the data, and the first thought was, students are struggling in math because the Student Success Center does not offer effective tutorials because you know it's always gonna be our fault. So, pull the data. One thing we found, we had a minimum 800 SAT. And I, I don't like to talk too much about test scores, but one of the things we found was that about 30% of our population, so you can have 800 overall, had a math SAT. 
below 350, okay? So, doesn't tell the whole story, but it tells part of the story. We also have faculty members who have PhDs in astrocalculus physics, right? They don't want to teach math 101, all right? So we had a disconnect in the type of teacher in the classroom and the type of student they were dealing with. We also looked at our curriculum and we found some things. The other thing we found is that when we admit students, most of them had not had math after the 11th grade. So almost a year and a half of not seeing math. Even the best math student will struggle with basic math if they don't receive a review or something. Everybody didn't need remedial, some of them just needed a review. So from that and sharing the data, we were able to develop a math emporium, change the structure, assign different teachers, reduce, we ended up reducing the need for remedial, increasing the success of math, and students had a much better experience in their math classes based on our assessment. So again, educating leadership who thought they kind of knew what was going on, but it was our responsibility to provide them with that truth. We also want them to speak about student success when they stand up. It's not always about everything else that's going on on campus. They have to say the words in your annual meetings and big groups, in the annual report to the board or to the state or whoever, they have to speak on them. Okay? And also, like I said, continuing to send that message of student success. Number two, you do need a university-wide committee. Now, I know most of us hate committees, but that's because most of them are ineffective. You know, we just basically go to meetings. It's not the committee structure, it's how we implement committees. So you gotta have an effective committee. And a lot of that begins with the charge. So I sat down with the chancellor and we were like, we're gonna have a student, a, a committee on student success. We took almost two or three months to think about the charge, uh, the, the timeline, who should be on the committee, uh, what some of the deliverables might look like, what the resources we might need. So just to plan to have a committee took us two or three months, but that was good work. So we didn't go in the room and the next day people got memos saying you're now on the committee. By the time they got to the meeting, well thought out, structure, they saw where we were going, had the input, and we ended up producing um, a good plan. So you have to have representatives from across the campus, and again, we know this. But I will encourage you to have people who when they come to the meeting, they can make a decision. I don't have time for you to have to go back and ask your boss what the answer is. You know, you are there, because that, that's the point. What's the, so now we gotta have another meeting. Now I'm not saying you don't go back, but I mean, it has to be people at a level who can make decisions, right? So we want them in the room, the decision makers in the room and from across the board. So you can think about others who might need to be on your committee. These are just a few people um, that were mentioned. I how many of you are responsible for retention of student success on your campus? Are you also responsible for enrollment management? Okay. So on many campuses, it's split. So you have student success over here, you have enrollment management over here. Sometimes it's all tied together. And so the, it doesn't matter the model, just get the right people at the table for your student success plan. I do recommend somebody from business and finance to be on your committee at all times. Business leaders, alumni, and those kind of folks because it's important to have that perspective as well. It's nothing like having a business leader talk to you about wanting to hire your students and what kind of skills they need and also wanting to help you retain those students. Because local business make plenty of money off our students. You know, it's like Christmas time sometimes at the mall with nothing but college students, you know. So they have a vested interest in wanting to make sure uh, even if it's their bottom line, but hey, we'll take that too, especially if they are willing to invest some of that bottom line back into our institutions. So, this sometimes is a tough part. You have to gather and analyze your data. You can't do this without data. You just can't. Um, you know, there are a lot of things, as I said before, without the data, I wouldn't have been able to convince my chancellor that the math problem was bigger than students not having effective tutorials. It was the data, and my chancellor was an engineer. So it was, show me the data and we'll go from there. So you have to have the data. But try to identify your existing data. Do not reinvent the wheel, and talk with IR, your institutional research, about what you already have. That's where you start. Before you start, oh, we need to do a survey on this. That data might be captured in a survey you already do on campus, through NESI, through just the data that we collected through applications. 
the, the information that's in your student information system, all of that, try to find existing data first. And make sure the data is consumable and easy to read. So this was the biggest issue I had with IR. It's like, don't send me all these statistical coefficients and all this. No, explain to us what this means. Give it to us plain so that we can make sense of it and do something with it. But if we gotta take two or three meetings just to decipher the data, we're wasting time and people get disengaged. So also, this is important. We talked earlier again about everybody being responsible for retention. So you have all these programs across campus. The, bi the biology department is offering a tutorial. Student support services has some things. The student success center has some stuff. Each department has something. But you need to do a, do a programmatic audit of every <coughs> program and resource on your campus dedicated to student success. You need to know if they've done assessments and if it's effective, you need to know all that information. So why you can pool those funds and reallocate to the areas that make the most sense to move your retention needle. Okay. People have sacred programs, they have pet programs. That's great. But if it's not showing a difference in the university, then again, back to those hard decisions we have to make about personnel, about resources, and about policy, okay? Now, if you need to do a survey, you do one. But I would try to stay away from your student success committee having to gather a whole lot of data. Best practices, again, extensive research has been done on best practices. I know a lot of times that research may not include our institution, sometimes it does. And we have a great resource in Brian's office in terms of data and the reports that you all get. But I'll say here, don't spend a whole lot of time researching something because the research is out there. It's, it's in terms of the best practices for student success. What you have to determine is which best practice are best for your campus. So study abroad is listed as a best practice in some circles. If the resources aren't there for a significant number of your students to do study abroad, that may not be the one you choose. Okay, it's a great thing for students to do, but if that hasn't been determined it's gonna move the needle for you, I would stay away from that. But look through what some of these best practices are. And here's, here's the thing. You could probably check off several of these as you have these on your, at your institution. But are they effective at your institution? It's not enough to say we have a summer bridge program. We had a summer bridge program on five of our campuses in the UNC system for five years. We did not see one percentage difference in retention. Okay, it just could have been how we implemented it. I know it's a best practice, but we didn't see that. So our legislature last year cut the money. Uh, we allocated it to some other things, but the point is, you know, we, we, you have to know which one of these are effective for you, how they work, you know, whether or not they're making a difference. So your plan. One of the things that I believe in terms of your retention plan is that it really has to be holistic. So. You can't, you know, you have to, of course, get the landscape, look at your data, think about best practices, do your audit, and then it's time to say, okay, let's start building our plan. Here are some of the components that a plan should have. Some action items on your pre-college engagement with students. Working with enrollment management, working with your summer programs. So often when I do these presentations, um, as campuses and usually it's a very low number, but how many of us actually with the summer programs and visitations we might have on our campus and programs we might have on our campuses collect data from those students even in middle school? Is that in your database in terms of enrollment? So you might have talent search, you might have upbound, bound, you might have a church group that rents out your facility, you might have the cheerleading competition happening on your campus great opportunity to collect that information on those students if possible in terms of just general information so that you can begin as early as possible having pre-college engagement with your students. Summer programs, bridge programs included. We need a seamless onboarding process. So we all, when we leave here, UNCF, Brian, he's gonna give us two tickets each to a cruise. Okay, so we're going on a cruise, everybody, after this meeting. Um, but think about it. <laughs> if you couldn't get your ticket, if you, when you got to the boat, they had this long line and they told you all these things, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, oh, we forgot you, oh, you're not in the system, automatically, before you can even go on your vacation, 
and think about all the great th time you're gonna have, you're already stressed out about how you're gonna, you know, even enjoy this experience. Because on the front end, you've had so many frustrations with, with the process. And so as much as you can, create seamless onboarding processes and your admissions and orientation and enrollment and registration processes as much as possible, as seamless as possible, and as less stress on, on uh, campuses. And so uh, this is an area, I'm so thankful I really didn't have to go through, because being on scholarship, they registered us for our classes. We went, I didn't even know you could drop a class out as a senior. I was like, what? People drop classes? <laughs> I thought we had to go to all of them. <laughs> so being first generation, I was just in there like whatever they told me to do, I, I, I did. So institutional climate and culture, this is important. You know, from the first person they talk to, to the alums, to everybody, we've got to create a culture of success, a welcoming environment. And I think we think we do this, but sometimes we don't. That's why we really have to ask our students and our parents about how we're doing in this area with our culture and with our climate for students because they have to be in a place where they feel valued, where they feel like they can be successful. So you got to gauge those things and really it starts with your front line. And sometimes we pay those people the least amount of money, give them the most work and put them in the most stressful situations without training about how to deal with it, how to de-escalate and how to problem solve. Okay. So making sure we create a, a culture of success and a climate for success. But that's even with our faculty and staff, okay? We have faculty stand up in faculty senate meetings and say, I didn't come here to teach. This is a research institution. I came here to do research. So what kind of culture are they giving off in their classrooms? What's happening there? So that's concern. So we've got to pull everybody into this to work on creating a culture. Institutional policies and procedures. So we just went through an overhaul of our policies for the UNC system based on data. So we looked and found that we had campuses that allow students to have, have unlimited course withdrawals. Just drop all you want. So what happens when they drop classes with their financial aid? Okay. When they lose their financial aid, they can't come back to school. I don't care if you have a 4.0, if you only pass 50% of your credits, you're in trouble. So we had to think about the number of course withdrawals, so we limited that to four. Campuses could choose four or 16 hours, whichever one they prefer. And so over the life of your undergraduate career, you can only withdraw from four classes or 16 hours, whichever one the campus chose. We also, did, say it again? How did that work? We implemented it in fall of 2014. We have found a decrease of about, only, I'll use one particular campus because I really trust their data because you know, we still cleaning up some data, some other campuses, but this one campus, they had a reduction of withdrawals by almost 50% during the fall, during the 14, 15 academic year. So that was part of the story. The other part of the story is we didn't see a decrease in GPA because the theory was if you make them stay in the course, they may get a D, they may get an F, the GPA is gonna drop. Nothing significant in dropping GPAs. Um, and we also saw uh, an increase few percentage points in financial aid eligibility. So we think it's going to work out okay. The downside that we're hearing from some of our campuses is that students are registering for less hours because, you know, why take 18? Because I can't really drop a course. I only get four and I want to save those for maybe my major courses when it gets real hard. Um, so that may, we may see that along the line as something we're still looking at in terms of progress toward degree with hours. Um, the co we had protests, we had students, we had the newspaper, we had everybody, um, lots of people concerned about this policy because we had one campus. And see, this is the thing about policy, I love being a system. So our, you can imagine North Carolina what our top institution is, but um, in terms of prestige. And they had a system where you could drop a course up until the eighth week of school and it never show up on your transcript. Whoa. That was their policy. So when they had to come into this policy, not only because you have four drops, you had to do it within the first 10 days. Anything after that, you will get a grade and it shows up on the transcript. Right. So you can imagine their transcript compared to another student who at another institution who had to stick it out and they're both applying to med school. Somebody has one transcript where they drop a bunch of classes by the eighth week and somebody else just had to stick it out. Mm -hmm. So there was some equity issues there. But I'd say in general, preliminary data, good. We still have a lot more assessment to do. Um, the other policy was, 
for good standing, it wasn't just based on GPA, it's now based on progression. So for you to be in good standing, not only do you have to have a GPA over 2.0, you also have to have at least 67% of your credits completed and passed. So that was different because it used to be just GPA. Um, and so a few other policies that we put in place that we're hoping that's going to change. But I would submit to you, really review your current academic policies. This is something we always do. We don't always assess. And then that policy might have been in place for 40 years for a whole different type of student, a cohort of student. So think about what's different now, what we might consider changing for your policies. Um, should have aspects that involve teaching and learning. So again, we, we, our advisors in my center would see students maybe two or three times a semester, but when it came time to think about well, why are they doing well, oh, it's poor advising. So we just did simple math. I said, you know, my advisors see students three times a semester, but faculty who see students possibly three times a week for 15 weeks, 45 to three, I think we should put some emphasis on the 45 times they potentially engage with a faculty member in addition to the advisor, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying you can't just think about advising in isolation. The core of what we do is teaching and learning. That's the core. That's what we do. So there has to be some focus on improving the teaching and learning experience for our students. So um, getting faculty involved, addressing some of those issues like I talked about before, it's not fair to have that faculty member who studied math for 100 years and all they want to do is figure out how to um, do equations to get the shuttle to the moon. You know, we need that, but not the student who's sitting there who's struggling in math if that teacher doesn't want that. So you got to think about your teaching and learning environment. Academic support goes without saying, but you do have to be strategic. You know, we offered calculus tutoring on our campus, but truthfully, we only had about five or six strong students who were good in tutoring calculus. So we had to be real strategic about where we place them, how much we pay them, what we do. And so think about your academic support, tutoring, advising, supplemental instruction, um, in the library, computer labs. All those things are part of your academic support structure. So review those, think about ways, and here's the other thing we did, simple, back to one of these no-cost things. Once we figured out where all the tutoring and everything was, we put it in one document on one website so you could see everywhere on the campus biology tutoring was offered, everywhere math was offered, when it was offered, how it was offered, who did it, so that students could go to one place to find all the academic support resources on our campus. Yes? Question. You mentioned that there was some pushback from some of the institutions. Did you find pushback from like the governing board when you were shifting some of these policies? Um, not really. Our board voted for this because they saw the data and realized that it was based on sound data. We just didn't get up and say we're going to change our policies. We ran detailed analysis on uh, students who were successful, uh, the, the of course withdrawals, students who lost their financial aid, how that looked. And so they were very supportive because the policy, like I said, it is a board, um, board of North Carolina Board of Governors policy. So um, they were very supportive. So student engagement and a vibrant campus life. You know, we have a lot of our campuses that some of y'all are out in the cut and students are <laughs> looking for things to do and they want to be engaged and they want, you know, things to do. So working with uh, all, all people on campus, not just student affairs, on creating the vibrant campus life and being engaged. We know our research, the research talks about student engagement and student success. When you feel connected to an institution, when you feel connected to the people, when you feel like it matters, there are activities that students can participate in, student leadership, speakers, those kinds of things, students are more likely to be successful. So we can, you know, uh, eliminate that particular part of the student success uh, matrix because it's important for students, they spend more time outside of the classroom than inside the classroom. So we wanna make sure the co-curricular environment is, is vibrant. Must include assessment and evaluation. Again, if you don't know how things are performing, we just keep doing them. Keep doing them, keep spending money. We think they're working, but we have to know that they're working. Then we have to know what aspects are, are working. And so making sure that your plan has a detailed assessment and evaluation strategy, right? And finally, back to that point of leadership and financial support. So leadership has to be involved. People are going to become very 
very uncomfortable when you start talking about resource um, reallocation and when you start talking about um, maybe changing up some strategies for teaching and doing those kinds of things, people are going to be very uncomfortable. And that's when you need leadership to step in. Sometimes you need leadership to be your cover when you're going out there talking to some people, tenure faculty, chairs, department heads, and those kinds of things. And again, one of the things that I did, it took me probably a semester, but I met with every department on the campus, all 40 of them. I took their specific data and we went over how their students were being retained and were persisting and graduating. Their data, nobody else. Because sometimes people have sanctuary syndrome, right? You stand up and talk and they think it's for everybody but them. Ooh, that was for Sister Mary. I know what she's going through. No, that was for you. You know, so I, so people would sit in a room, we'd talk about retention, and specific chairs wouldn't necessarily think I was talking about them. So I went to one chair, and he's like, well, I know why my students aren't being successful, because they have to take calculus and chemistry their first semester, and they're not doing well. I said, well, actually, the class that they are failing the most is the intro to your major course. They had a higher failure rate in your own course than they did calculus and chemistry. I had the data, they had to make some changes. So every department went to them and talked with them about how they could, how we could partner, how we could get involved. So some suggestions, again, you need buy-in from constituencies across the campus. You can't do this by yourself. It can't be two or three people who don't have power. Don't create a retention committee with people who are so buried down in the organization that they have no power, right? Uh, no more than three to five broad goals. We don't need a dissertation on student success. We know the three or four things that work, and in addition to that, you want people to read the plan and buy into the plan. So it doesn't have to be long and drawn out. We know what we need to do. We just need a strategic way to really get it done. Student success plan of three to four years. You've got to constantly reevaluate this thing. Don't do a 10-year plan on student success. Students are changing every day, technology changing, uh, goals are changing, leadership changes. Three to four years, that's all you need. Um, no more than 10 to 15 pages, including major graphs and charts. Okay, you know, again, this has to be something, it's almost like an infographic, something that you can look at fairly quickly, get a sense of where we're going and what we're doing. It's not too wordy, put that in the appendix. The piece that you want people to read and connect to, you've got to do it in a way where it's eye catching, it tells the story in a simple way so that people can get it, see the need for it, and want to get involved. And then we need academic and student affairs synergy. We really need campus synergy. It's, I, I mentioned this, and I'm only gonna do, go through a couple slides on this, but too many times we're siloed in campuses. You know, Y'all know that. We have faculty, we have student affairs, we have academic affairs, we have finance, we have alumni, we have external, we have advancement. But <coughs> what we're all about and need to connect on is student success. Everything that we do points to graduation. Everything we do points to retention. And the thing about, I set a timer for myself so I wouldn't, so I could stop when I was about 15 minutes left. So we, you have to think about retention and drill it down from, we start at graduation, you back up to persistence, progression, financial aid, you need all those things to get a student there. So I'm convinced that to build a strong retention plan begins at the course level. Because what do we do? We pass courses, we pass semesters, we pass years, and we get down to graduation. So one place that you all can really start that's something you know, very simple is working with early alert programs. We didn't have any money for early alert programs. You know what I did? Went to institutional research. I said, tell me the five classes that my freshmen struggle in the most. Highest DFWI rate, five courses. I created a spreadsheet and I sent it to the faculty in all of those areas. And this, I populated the spreadsheet myself because I could see who was in there. So let me back up. My staff populated the Excel spreadsheets <laughs> because with the names. But seriously, I sent it to all the Math 101 faculty and said, just tell me these three things about these students every couple weeks attendance, grade, behavior issue, and email it to me and we'll do the rest. It, it wasn't about, I didn't have to go out and buy a $50,000 a year enrollment software 
that we've done that. And I'm going to tell y'all something. Even being on a school called A&T, the technology piece, you struggle getting those things set up in your, if you, with your technology. But that spreadsheet worked better than some of the technology that we purchased in those five courses. Okay? So you, so much you can do that doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Um, again, we, we have to think about students inside and outside of the classroom. Thinking about student affairs. So again, just working strongly with everybody on campus. Don't allow people to say that they don't have time. They shouldn't be involved. You know, so we had to talk to our faculty. It was, well, when students don't graduate, we have a thing in our state called low producing programs. If in two years you don't graduate at least 10 people, your program goes on the chopping block. So if there's any kind of self-preservation that will motivate you, it's to get 11 people across that stage in two years. So you sometimes have to make it personal with people. And we've had programs cut. We have a lot of controversy about the programs that were cut. But at the end of the day, you know the metric. You know why we do it. And it has to be a vested interest as to why you want to keep the student successful. And unfortunately, sometimes it's not about the student. Why you want to push through the success? Sometimes it's about self, and sometimes you gotta to appeal to that. So, to the no-cost and low-cost initiatives. Again, find ways to showcase that you care for students and good customer service to students and parents. Don't cost a whole lot of money. Train, encourage people to be nice. That goes a long way. Um, develop a care team on your campus. Now here's something you can do weekly or every two weeks, and that is pull together your care team counseling services, um, you know, academic affairs and others. Everybody bring the list of the students that have been identified through early warning, people who just called your office and said this student is having trouble, and you all sit in that room and figure out ways in which you can help those students that are on that list. It, at its core, I should, you know, tell my staff, so many of them, you know, have master's degrees and all this, they all want to go get doctors, and I said, that's great. It's wonderful. I said, but at the core of what we do in student success, this is social work. This is trench work. You know, you want it to be glamorous, but at many, most of the time it's not. So with this team, this is almost like a social work team, a case approach to work with students to figure out sometimes they need $100 to get food. Sometimes they need to connect to some social services in the community to help them get through. Sometimes it's just a conversation to say, you can do it, I understand. So you've got to pull this team together. Again, low cost, no cost. Pull this team together, and every student that shows up on your list for that time period that you allot, you figure out somebody who's going to touch them. And I mean touch them. Email, that's fine. Phone, that's fine. But I mean put your hands on them. So we used to call them foot campaigns. If you lived on campus, my staff would show up in the dorm. If you live, if you had a class, we knew which building you were in. Stepping out of class, ignoring all of our emails. Hey, Johnny, oh. <laughs> you know, and we we would talk to him right there in the hallway. So, I had a handout, and I'll make sure it goes a part of this. But again, created predictive analytics, real basic way. I created the top ten things that we knew that were barriers to student success, and I had my staff check them off. Are they in the band? Do they play fall sports or in the band? That's a risk factor. What was there? Were they in remedial math? That's a risk factor. We did this by hand. We checked it out. I didn't have a detailed analytics program. So if they had at least three, we had a strategy. If they had less than that, we had a strategy. It didn't cost a whole lot of time. Yes? I just was curious relative to how, how we were able, I mean, obviously, you can motivate folks through threatening them, but how were you able to motivate your, your staff to take that kind of interest in <laughs> specifically with going to the class. And that's something that we've tried to mm -hmm. really, really have some of our staff do is, hey, go to the residence hall, go go to their class, pull their, their class schedule. I mean, how, how were you able to kind of get that kind of buy-in? Because often, like you said, the folks that are on the front line, the lowest paid, mm -hmm. you know, they're quick to you know, tell you, I'm going to be and you all this too, but I don't get paid for all that. I ain't, you know, that's above and beyond right. my pay grade. I mean, people will say that. I mean, so right. how, how were you able to, and that's something. 
Well, one thing is that we work very hard, it took us a long time and work with HR on this to try to make sure that in the recruiting and selection process that we found ways to identify the people coming in the door that had that type of caring and concern for students and the skill set to do the work. So that was one thing. The other thing is as the onboarding process went forward, we made sure that we implemented to them the values that we wanted them to have. And so um, we talked a lot about caring and concern and accuracy and, and excellence in your work and how you take notes in a folder down to that. I mean, we created some structure. So it was a lot of communication about what we value. But then I also showed them up front how they would be evaluated and how merit raises would be meted out based on the, work, the performance and the work. So I believe a lot of upfront conversations. I also believe that um, there comes a time when you have to show people the door nicely, but you do. I mean, this may not be the job for you. You know, I just tell them, fly butterfly, fly. You know, this is this is not necessarily, you know, go find your true calling, right. for real. Right. I mean, and so, and it was never, a, antagonistic conversation and there was time you know some people I would say you know is this really what you want to do heart to heart how can I help you transition to something else because I want you to be happy we can fill this seat with somebody else so a lot of it is just you have to send the signal and the values to people about what you require and again if we don't see that make the tough call um, you talked about the early warning system, and here's another one, looking at students with unmet need and figuring out a way when you can to allocate your resources based on that. Because we found two, three, four hundred dollars sometimes can make the difference for students. And you know, sometimes, um, I, I got my master's from Howard and recently we received these emails saying um, we have 300 seniors who won't get their degree because they have balances and alumni kind of stepped in and, and paid those balances and that kind of thing. So that you can do that on a yearly basis, that unmet need, figuring out what's the unmet need, find ways to uh, provide that where you can because that can definitely uh, keep students in school. And so just some final thoughts. Student success is too important to leave the chance. An integrated, collaborative, and strategic approach is needed to produce sustainable outcomes. Um, some of your campuses are engaged in some of the activities we talked about, but again, you got to identify which ones work best for you and find a way to scale it up so that more students can take advantage of that particular program. Uh, students will be even more successful if they're entrenched in learning environments that develop both their cognitive and effective domains. We've got to work with the whole student. Communicate your successes frequently, internally, and externally. We no longer have to wait for the Journal of Higher Ed to come out six months after we submit an article. Between the, twi the Twitter, the Facebook, the Snapchat, you can tell your story all day long. All day long. So tell it. Use it. Don't wait until you have 10 years worth of data, a semester, or this or that. Communicate your successes, because students and parents and others start ca uh, catching on to that. So tell your own story and tell it frequently. And finally, we are the institutions represented in this room that do the most with students in terms of student success. I can tell you, I worked at the University of Georgia, not Ivy, but SAT scores average, 1250, very elite institution. When students come in there, they're already at a certain place. And so we move them eh, a little bit. The work we do to move students, you know, it's just totally different from what other institutions may have to do. We should be the models. When you look up the literature on student success and who's researching and who's writing the articles on student success, we're not present with the way we should be. So my staff and I at a and I said, we don't just go to conferences anymore. We submit proposals and we tell our story every time. And I'm proud to say, just as a toot of the horn before we end the session, that we went to the National Academic Advising Conference where there are probably, oh, four or 500 sessions. It's a huge conference. And our presentation, the last presentation we did before I left, was rated as the top presentation <coughs> for that conference by our peers. You know, we have a story. We have to tell it. And we shouldn't be ashamed to tell it. And we got to stand up and make people understand that while we can, a lot of negativity may be said about kind of where we are, we have to tell our story about our successes because we are the model. And we should stand up, take our rightful place in front, and be the model for student success. And with that,